recording but that's not all right officially recording welcome everyone this is week 10 this is part two of our open science garden uh, this open science garden is the the, the three-part bit that we're doing in the cohort where we go through different aspects of open science this cohort we are using unesco's open science definition and going through nine of the concepts uh, today, we'll be talking about open hardware, open source software, and openness to diversity in knowledge. Um, and we have two of our speakers already here. The third speaker will be joining in a bit. So just for a reminder, we have a code of conduct that applies here. If you experience or witness something unacceptable, something makes you uncomfortable, or if you have any suggestion for us to make your accessibility better, please do email us at team at openlifesci.org. Or you can reach out to one of the organizers, uh, Yo, Amy, Bernice, or me directly, and our emails are in the etherpad. We have an author AI transcription. Uh, it is enabled. If you find it difficult to follow, you can also write in the chat. If you want us to go slowly, write us in the chat. Um, but uh, you can look at the caption by, you have a, in the bottom of your screen, you have a show caption option, and you can click on that. Um, then, as usual, we will have a breakout session today. So please edit your name to add a W in front of your name if you are interested in joining a room with written prompts, or if you're interested in being in a spoken room, you can add S. So there could be any reason that you want to be in the written room if your internet is not great, if you're not in a room where you can speak, um, or you just generally have a better interaction with written. But if you are uh, like me, who likes to talk to each other, you could also add S in front of you. So I'll go ahead and put S in front of me. Uh, our speakers are invited if they would like to be in the breakout, but no pressure. Uh, you both will be talking right before the breakout session will start. Um, okay, so that was it today. I'm going to start with Andre, who's our speaker for Open Hardware, and Andre will do a quick introduction of himself, followed by the talk. Andre. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks again for the invite. It's great to be here. Um, I hope I have something to share with you that is interesting as well. You already have the link to the talk, to the slides on the Padlet. Um, let me just, hold on, share this. Ah. Um, so, as I get around my way of technology, I can say I work at the University of Sussex uh, as a scientific officer, uh, where I support the labs in the Department of Neurosciences, um, which means I'm developing new tools and equipment, repairing, uh, doing bits of data um, analysis codes, and so on. For the last uh, 10 years, I've been working with open science and open source hardware. Um, I volunteer an NGO called Trend in Africa um, in their um, in their open science space and efforts. Um, I also started a website called Open Neuroscience, where it's all about open source tools for neurosciences. It's a community driven project now. Um, here you have my email, my Twitter, and Mastodon handles. You can always contact me, send emails. Um, I also do a bit of consulting. Uh, under the banner of Prometheo Science, which is a company I started here in the UK, all about open source hardware and open science. Um, feel free to interrupt me at any time during the talk and or write questions on the chat. Um, yeah. So before I give you like a broad definition of open, open source hardware, the reason why I like it so much is that I think nowadays we cannot do research uh, without tools, it's even as simple as a laptop or even as a notebook and a pen, right? But you need tools to actually gather your thoughts and write and actually collect data and so on. And so a lot of the open science conversation has started with open access and publications and then kind of moved its way backwards uh, into code and data and so on. And there is uh, a lot of people talking about open hardware and how we should be pushing more for this or that this should be the new standard for research and for many other things um, in things that are publicly funded, right? As 
many things. There are many definitions of open source hardware. The one that I like the most is from the Open Source Hardware Association, which is an organization in the US that has fought long and hard about what it means to have open source hardware, right? And as you can see here, it's quite long, but the take home for today is like open source hardware is hardware which the design is made publicly available so that anyone can study, modify, distribute, make and sell those designs or hardware, right? It's very similar to open source software in a way, right? But of course you have particularities because you're making physical objects out of them, right? And so I won't bother you with the rest of the definition. You can go and read if you are interested in this. Um, but the point is we now have the technology and the tools to have very complete description of hardware into digital files, into digital formats that allow local reproduction, reproduction and creation. Um, and so to give you an example why this is important, right? If you think about microscopes, these are these workhorses that are used on many, many different fields of science. They were initially developed on the 17th century. Uh, what you can see here on the image on the left is a model from the 1920s. And on the right is a little bit more modern, maybe from 2010, right? And as you can see, the idea behind it didn't change it that much, right? It's still some optics that basically take your, something that is really small and amplify it so that you can actually see it, right? A basic model costs 5,000 pounds. If you want to add fluorescence, that's another 5,000 pounds, even though there are no patents for this for a long time already. And on top of all of that, if you look at this, right? Like it's a big metal heavy block that needs to be powered on all the time. And so if you think about places that are not, or places that don't have a very good electrical grid infrastructure, um, you'd have trouble using one of these, right? Plus uh, they're normally designed for European and US markets with the idea that if you need support and repair and whatever you are, and you are outside of these markets, then you have really a hard time, right? If you think about what we recently learned in the pandemic that our supply chains are really fragile, Let's say I'm originally from Brazil. So let's say I got this in Brazil and it's still the case today, right? Um, it becomes much more expensive because we have all the import and custom, and custom taxes and so on. And if it breaks, it'll be very, very hard to send somebody to repair. And so you end up with a really, really heavy paperweight on your desk, right? So this is a couple of the reasons why um, we should be pushing for open hardware because these are the tools of our trade and they're black boxes all around, right? Um, of course, not all is lost. A lot of people are developing open hardware. Uh, and what I'm showing you here are example of four different types of microscopes that are open hardware that have been developed in different places of the world. So you have uh, Germany, Chile, uh, UK, and the US as places that develop each of one of these. And they're all specialized for one type of use. And what is interesting is that all of them, except the one on the right, are below uh, $200 to produce, right? The one on the right is a really small miniature type of microscope that it can actually implant on animals and therefore it's a bit more expensive, but that's not important here. The point is uh, you get from open hardware, you get this diverse background of many different types of hardware you can buy. Uh, or that you can build and or buy because there are, there are now companies selling open hardware um, and they all have special case uses. And so um, this allows you for better choice in terms of what you need for your experiments. Um, they're also affordable, as I mentioned, and because all the designs are open, people can simply replicate them using the tools that they have available or even change parts, either to customize them or because they don't have that specific component available at that moment, but they know why that component is used in that design because it's all documented. And so these are much easier to modify. So in a way they make it also for faster innovation inside research. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that they also allow for massive parallelization of experiments, right? So let's say I take a $200 microscope, I build 10 of them, um, I get, theoretically 10 times faster data collection, right? Uh, and I'm still cheaper than a 5,000 5, pound microscope. The other thing is because they're so affordable, I can put this in the hands of students, right? 
And so I wouldn't, maybe a lot of places wouldn't, they're having a 10,000 pound microscope and say, let all the students have a go at it and understand how it works by actually using it. Because if it breaks, it's a catastrophe, right? But now that I have things that are much more affordable, of course, this is not as affordable everywhere in the world, but 200 is much better than 10,000, right? And so the idea is that now you can have students that are actually having hands-on um, experience with the tools that they're gonna be using for research later. Um, just a side note on the quality of this thing. So this is Open Flexure, which is a very, very strong project with a community behind it that was started uh, here in the UK, not by me, but at the University of Bath. And so just to say that I'm actually really like, this is a really impressive project. And I think it, it clearly like deserves to be mentioned in a lot of places. Uh, and what you're seeing here is actually one of these devices that fit on the palm of your hand can be battery driven. And on the right side, what you're seeing is a blood smear. And on the inset, the zoom part is basically a red blood cell and inside the darkish, bluish, purplish thing is actually a malaria parasite, right? So now you have a $200 device that is portable, battery driven, that is able to do malaria detection, which is quite um, precise optically. And not only that, and I'm sorry if I'm going over time, I'm about to be done. Um, it also, this is, they're working in collaboration with a group in Tanzania that has been co-developing this with this, this with them. And so now they can have this ecosystem in Tanzania that is able to provide the tools needed for healthcare and science locally. Um, yeah, these are obviously not the only projects. There, is, there are a lot of projects for open hardware. These are just some examples. This is something we're working on. What you're seeing on the y-axis is a fraction of papers from uh, PubMed that have the keyword open hardware on the x-axis is time. And of course the fraction is really small, but what is interesting is here is like how fast this curve is growing over time. So there are a lot of papers coming out that are dealing with open hardware, either describing open hardware or talking about it from a more social aspect. Um, we have, a. if you want more details on open hardware and how to get started and so on, me, Julieta Arancio and Alex Cruchetta, we started this project called Open Hardware Makers, which is in a way a little bit similar to Open Seeds, where we're mentoring and doing online training um, on open hardware. This was a community developed curriculum, which you can find on those links. So there are a lot more information. As I mentioned, you can also reach out to me and to us at any time. Um, here are some links for interesting open hardware projects or communities. There are two journals dedicated to open hardware if you're in the academic space. There are a lot of non-academic links here as well. And with that, I would like to say thank you. And I'm sorry if I went a little bit over time. Thank you so much, Andre. Um, no worries. Gonna stop uh, sharing your yeah, screen and you. just a virtual round of applause for Andre <laughs> for the talk. Uh, folks, if you have any question, please um, put it in the chat or you could also use the etherpad. Um, Nikki says thanks for all the resources. This is just for the context for everyone, um, open hardware is something that we don't really hear about a lot. And as you heard from Andre, the, the reason is that when you have conversation around open science, hardware is generally not considered in places where there is already hardware. So often these kind of conversations happen where the inaccessibility of hardware makes it difficult for people to use it. Thanks, Saule, for a great comment. You all know that Andre is also on Slack. You can reach out to Andre there, but also Andre is one of our experts. If you want to invite Andre, uh, please drop him an email or someone from his team can join us. Thank you so much. I'm going to um, let folks put their question in the chat and uh, move on to Michelle's talk today on open source software. Thanks, Melvika. Let me just share my screen and get started here. Uh, so hi, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity to come and talk to you all. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, but uh, Thank you very much for inviting me to, to come and uh, meet with you all today. So I'm Michelle Barker, I'm the Director of the Research Software Alliance, 
and I'm here today to talk a bit about uh, open source software and there are my contact details. Uh, happy to uh, be in contact with you, any of you, um, there's different ways obviously for doing so. I wanted to start by explaining uh, what open source software is and as Andre said, it, it's very similar to open source hardware in terms of definition. Uh, so it's software where the source code, uh, the, the way in which the software is written, the programming, uh, that anyone can inspect, modify, and enhance. So like open, soft, open source hardware, it's open, like open data. Uh, so that means anyone uh, can inspect it, uh, which can help in a project's reproducibility or credibility or transparency. Uh, people can modify it, so it can be really helpful. People can find bugs or, uh, you know, uh, build on it. People can also, uh, you know, take the code and set it up, you know, in a separate instance and, and use it to, as a basis to create uh, something else. So there's a lot of benefits of uh, having open source software. And these are some uh, big name uh, open source software that you may use, uh, Firefox, LibreOffice, WordPress, Chrome, uh, some of the examples that have been very successful beyond the research community internationally as showing the benefits of open source software. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, why uh, software in particular is important uh, and then extrapolate out to open source software. So this is a nice quote from Neil Chu Hong, which says, without data, it's difficult to validate results, but without code, we waste the opportunity to advance science. Uh, so building what Andre said, there's been a lot of work on open data uh, for the last 10 years uh, and fair data uh, there's been less on open source software or research software. It's, it's an emerging field. There's been more on that than open source hardware, uh, but it's an area that still really needs uh, a light shone on it uh, so that we can really recognize the value of that software and the people that maintain and, and develop it. That's also very crucial. We also want to briefly touch on what is research software, which is probably uh, something that many of you ha have encountered. So research software is often open source software, uh, but it's not also not always. Uh, so research software is simply uh, software that's been developed during the research process uh, or for a research purpose. And there's a much longer definition reference there if you're interested. So if you're wondering if you've had much to do uh, with research software or, or open source software, uh, there's this nice graphic here from a, a blog on roles of research software, which helps explain the different places where you might encounter software in the research environment. So research software is part of our instruments. So if you use a telescope or an MRI or a microscope, chances are uh, there's some software involved in uh, that tool working and getting the data to you uh, in a way that you can then play around with it. In some cases, uh, research software is the instrument. So if you do modeling, climate science modeling, infectious diseases modeling, uh, then software is the instrument uh, that enables that analysis. Third example there, research software, you know, is used to analyze research data. So you may have a research background, uh, you may be supporting a community uh, that work with research. Chances are someone's data somewhere along the track or your data uh, you've used a, a little bit of script to analyze your data, uh, or you may have used an online portal uh, that had software behind it that enabled you to do that. I've got a son who's a third year science student and his lecturer gives them bits of script to help them analyze uh, some of their work. You may also have used research software uh, to, to visualize your results, or it may have been part of the infrastructure that's really underlying uh, a workflow you're using uh, or, or a website that enables you to bring your data and analyze it uh, using a whole range of tools and then share it with a range of different people. The chances are that software and particularly research software is some part of your experience if, if you have that research background or if you're supporting uh, researchers. Uh, why should it be important to you? Uh, great to hear you already are working with the UNESCO recommendation on open science. So I was going to highlight here that open scientific knowledge, the section up in green. Oh, sorry. Oops, that didn't work. Oh, yeah. Includes open source software and, and open source code. Uh, so as uh, we're trying to enable open scientific knowledge, uh, all of those little green uh, circles are important, but open source software and, and source code uh, is part of that, as is open hardware. 
if you're interested in this area and would like to uh, learn a little bit more about what best practices are in this area uh, to support your community or your own work, uh, here are a few basic papers. Because one of the things we find in the research community is that people that do software engineering often don't have much training in it, if at all, often they're self-trained. Uh, even if they've got a job like research software engineer that sounds like they've got a very strong IT background, that may not be the case. Quite often they have research backgrounds and they're people who've just enjoyed uh, doing a bit of coding and then have uh, been the only person in their team that does it and kind of become the expert. And they may have learned some good practices along the way, uh, but generally there, there's quite a big gap. If you come from some disciplines, uh, maybe like astrophysics or bioinformatics, uh, you may have learned some coding in your degree, uh, but there's a lot of disciplines, you know, particularly some of the humanities, uh, where some of the software practices uh, are still not uh, really widely shared. So here's some very basic tools uh, on how to do uh, research software, uh, which also touches on open source best practices. So my organization is the Research Software Alliance, uh, which works to shine a light internationally on the need to recognize the value of research software and those who develop and maintain it. And we do that by working uh, with existing organizations, uh, national uh, governments that support research and therefore support research software, uh, disciplinary organizations uh, like the American Geophysical Union, Union or uh, Elixir in the life sciences, uh, or organizations that have a particular focus, uh, like training, uh, like the open life sciences. Uh, so we try and work across all the existing communities uh, to improve that recognition. So that's a, a brief introduction uh, to the importance of open source and what it is and how it relates to research software and perhaps your roles. And so I look forward to your questions and some discussions later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, again, a very virtual round of applause for Michelle. Uh, please do ask uh, questions that you have for Michelle or, or Andre and Michelle. I'm going to check the event, uh, our etherpad. And I don't see a question yet, but I'm going to just get us started with one question. Um, which is about the connection between open source software and hardware. How do you think the current status is between the communities? Because open source software community is so mobilized and so connected, whereas open source hardware is very localized. Um, yeah, I wonder, Andre, if you can respond to that and then Michelle, your opinion. Yeah, so a lot of a lot a lot of hardware these days uses like need software right like you need to program it somehow like data collection happens so it needs to write data and so on um so yeah so it's in the interesting of the open hardware community that we speak more to the open software community but i think we're still getting our sh sorry our stuff together <laughs> in a way that we are now getting together as groups and engaging with you know policy makers and getting things off the ground um, which is not to say we should not be doing this, this more connection work right now, but it's just a better of bandwidth, I think, uh, of not being able to do everything at once. Yeah, I would add to that, that I guess the fact that I don't have much to say to answer that in itself answers it, that uh, uh, they're mm -hmm. probably still siloed and, uh, you know, that's probably something that I should really reflect on. Um, so yeah, the open source hardware community, as you said, it is probably a, a little bit smaller and a little bit more nascent in its development. <clears throat> open source software, uh, uh, you know, obviously has this massive following in industry and, and lots of great examples there, which doesn't, we don't necessarily have a lot of crossover of those learning to research community, uh, but we're working on that. Um, yeah, Andre and I should talk, I think is the answer to that question. Thank you so much uh, for that. Um, also, Michelle, can I ask you, because you've been involved a lot in policy advocacy around open source software and how it's recognized as one of the creditable, citable, and legitimate contribution to science. Can you comment on 
on that journey, like how successful that has been or where has that the challenges occurred uh, in recognizing software development as the scientific contribution? Yeah, I mean, it's a journey that's still ongoing. Uh, you know, we, we've made some great strides, but there, there's a lot more to do. So one of the problems is that, uh, you know, software, and I guess even more so open hardware, is just hidden in research. Uh, so lots of people may use research software without really reflecting on it. Uh, you know, it's provided by their department. It's a common tool in their discipline. You know, the PhD student just writes a bit of code for them. So it's not a skill set. Uh, that has been really valued and therefore if you've ever written a funding application where you wanted to do some research software development until recently you wouldn't have even mentioned that uh, you know you would have just said we, we need to do some data analysis and uh, not really highlighted that you actually needed someone uh, with a research software engineering skill set and funding particularly for them so a lot of our work has been uh, shining a light on the fact that yeah, research software is crucial. We have surveys that uh, show that 95% of researchers say it's important to the work, but up to 50% of researchers actually do some of their own coding. Uh, so uh, we've been working, for example, with funders to help them understand how much of their existing portfolios already support research software without their knowledge and the benefits of actually recognizing that and having funding specifically for research software elements and having grant uh, setups where you actually can ask for a research software engineer uh, to be funded. Uh, so yeah, that, that's some of the kinds of things that have happened. Yeah, thank you so much that you're doing that. And that's a really great insight to get people to actually see that they're already benefiting from it rather than recognizing it as a new thing. Andre, you have any comment on hardware and policy advocacy from Gosh, maybe? Yeah. So there is, yeah. So as Mavika and I didn't mention this on the talk, I should have. So there is a big community called the Gosh community, which is the gathering for open science hardware. And these are really people from all over the world. Um, and they've been really organized in doing things in sort of all, like all levels, like independent projects are creating new types of hardware, but then big associations within this network are like writing pieces for policymakers, for granting agencies and so on. And one example, for instance, this Loan Foundation in the US who has been pushing for grants on open source hardware. Um, and, but it's still very starting work, right? And I guess I could say, in the same way that um, that the example that Michelle Michelle wrote on the chat, the CERN in Europe actually um, does a lot of open hardware because of the idea that you know, like it outlives a lot of companies, and so ten years from now, twenty years from now, if a company that produces something that is inside a particle accelerator is now bust, right? A company is bust, then you end up with this gigantic massive thing that doesn't work anymore so they push a lot of for open source hardware which is gaining a lot of traction has been gaining a lot of traction in europe as well <laughs> sorry i digressed a little bit but yeah Um, yeah, my screen had frozen. That was very uh, awkward. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I have, oh, Michelle, that picture. Yes. This is, do you want to comment on that? I have one more question, please, but please do comment on, on just the uh, economy and politics around this. Yeah, I just put in a chat, uh, in the chat, a, a cartoon that's commonly used to describe the challenges with open source software, because I haven't talked about the facts, uh, you know, the economic challenges. Uh, so because open source software is poorly recognized, uh, you know, often maybe just start out developed by a, a few people who uh, you may be doing it for a research project with no more funding, but then they keep <laughs> doing it. Uh, but what happens in software is you have dependencies. Uh, when you build software, it might be dependent on a number of other pieces of software that other people have built and yours doesn't run properly unless theirs are running properly. And then other people may build software that's dependent on yours. Uh, so we might have, we, we do, we have examples, documented examples of where 
you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people have been uh, actually dependent unknowingly on some small piece of open source software that honestly has been maintained by one person doing it for free. Uh, and, uh, you know, at some point it said, I need some funding. Uh, and, you know, that's really shone light on the whole issue. So, yeah, the, the, the ways in which to recognize and fund open source software, because it's free and open and developed by a community, uh, that brings a lot of challenges. Yeah, I um, I think this is also connected to somewhat how open source software has often worked by hobbyists somewhere in the world, but then they benefit a lot of people and sometimes privatized organizations are better placed to benefit from them. And the funding issue that you're talking about, probably a lot of us do not know exactly how to ask for funding for the work we're doing because we haven't been taught and that's a skill. One of the last questions I wanted to ask both of you, um, and someone actually added in the ether part that in the context of open source hardware, that if things are more accessible, it's easier for people to learn from it and training purposes. They, so they answered it in the terms of students, but I wanted to ask a question around localization effort that both of you are involved in. Um, so how hardware has been so important in getting the Global South researchers to engage in the scientific community to a degree they wouldn't if the hardware is not available to them. And also making that available locally means that people have authority over you know, what they produce. And similarly, I, I know that, that RESA is uh, identifying scope in a uh, building community across Asia, because I just met Serenjit, who's been working in this area. So from your both of your point of view, would you be able to comment on what is the importance and requirement of localization and working with local community? I'll start with Michelle, you, and then Andre. Yeah, it, one of the problems with, with, with software in, in research is that it's often built across disciplines internationally but it's funded usually by national governments who only want to fund things that, that help their national environment. Uh, so there's a lot of work uh, being done in various countries to identify what's happening in particular countries so those governments will fund it. Uh, but there's some areas uh, where this is still fairly nascent work and, and we funded um, across Asia and Latin America and Africa uh, uh, last year, um, some consultants to unearth some of the things that were happening in their lo local communities and the tools who's part of today's call was involved in that. Uh, and a recent um, graduate of OLS, Sarenji Kalbogal was in, involved in that. And, and to build on that, we now have employed two uh, community managers located in Asia and Africa to, to continue those national efforts and regional efforts. Uh, because to convince funders of the value of uh, this investment, they just have to see local examples uh, or, or even, you know, universities or uh, regional funders, you know, local government funders uh, have to be able to see what's happening in their local environment. So we're, we're trying to, whilst we work, mostly work internationally to shine the lights on things where areas need to grow, we try and shine, uh, assist in shining that light on uh, what's happening uh, in local areas as well. Um, yeah, so localization is also really important um, in hardware, and I don't think I've seen funds that take special consideration to say, look, we're going to fund this if you do this here and in this other area that might be affected and so on. Normally, as Michelle said, the contrary, like, you know, we want to fund things locally or that are within a country and so on. Um, However, what I can say is that there are, because of the orders of magnitude cheaper that open hardware is or more affordable than open hardware is, we're starting to see some interesting things in terms of knowledge, not only coming from North, South, like global North and global South, so to say. Uh, and one simple example, right? So there is this project called Precious Plastics which people might have heard of, they have open source library of tools that allow you to recycle plastics, right? And we are now starting to set up a small unit here in Sussex to actually recycle plastic bottles into 3D printing filament with the longer term goal that we're gonna recycle more plastics. But the point is, this is like, this original project is from the Netherlands, but then a group in, um, 
I think Vietnam took their tools and adapted them to make prosthetics, right? So now you have a group in Vietnam that is making prosthetics locally uh, out of recycled plastics. And this is knowledge that we are hoping to bring over to Sussex and partner with the medical school so that we can start developing a project in that area. And so not exactly, this is not exactly replying to your point because I don't think I had anything else to add from what Michelle said, but the point is now we're starting to see this movement of knowledge that is not only north south but rather is coming from all directions um which is really interesting in my opinion um yeah thank you so much both of you for sharing insights from your work and doing this important work that you're doing and continue to inspire all of us thank you for coming here today to talk to us and tell us about your work and uh, we look forward to getting our uh, OLS members connecting with your communities and with you directly. So folks, please give them a final round of applause and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you online. You, you're very welcome to stay here, but I also know you have busy day or uh, for Michelle, it's end of the day. So <laughs> thank you once again. Um, thank you. Awesome. So folks, with all of that that you heard now, we will be sending you in a breakout discussion and the breakout discussion. So Omar, can I just check with you if you have access to breakout and if you could start putting people in different rooms while I'll, uh, I'll explain what this is. So Hello. we will be- I'll do that. Uh, thank you so much, Malika. Thank you so yes. much, Malika. Uh, Paz yes. is going to send people to breakout rooms. And, all right, uh, awesome. Mm. Thanks so much, Paz. Thanks, Omar. So I'll, I'll explain. Um, there are two questions that you'll be discussing. You'll have about 10 minutes. We'll put three to four people in the room. Um, the question you're going to discuss, what are the benefits of becoming open scientists? And please keep these two talks that you heard about. You know, either you're applying. Sorry, Omar, I'm going to mute you. Um, so thinking about open source software, hardware, previous calls you've also heard from uh, our speakers on open data and different parts of open science. So think about what are the benefits for your own community, but also think about what are the incentives you're providing to people to participate in science? Uh, have you encountered throughout? Uh, either you have put in place or you're, you have encountered as a community member. So I'm gonna put that in the chat. Um, and I apologize when I say research, I'm actually gonna call it science and research. So let me put that question. And folks who don't have W in front of your name will probably put you in the written room as well, assuming you're okay with either of those. Um, and you'll have 10 minutes. Paz, are we okay to let them go? <clears throat> yeah, I'll be assigning them so they can go. Okay. Welcome everybody. Um, we will do a very quick uh, report out. I know that some folks have taken notes. Um, we had we had room one with spoken and from the written room folks, if you're okay to speak up, you can raise your hand who will like to um, report out, but you could obviously use written because that's the purpose. We don't want to force folks to feel written to speak. Um, so can I, find someone from room one. Um, I think Carmel and Chuka, you were with the speakers there. Would you like to share some insights from your room? How about Carmel, you start and then Chuka, you can add. Uh, so we talked about um, the importance of open science software, especially for um, people that are either independent researchers or from the global south, where they do not have the resources to purchase expensive software like SPSS and in vivo, uh, for which are important researching tools. Um, and then the conversation um, continued as well with some of uh, Chuka's uh, questions, so perhaps you could take over.
All right, thank you. Um, Carmel had uh, just uh, made a, a quick recap of some of the some of the things we discussed, and uh, we went ahead to also talk about um, the some of the reasons, some of the uh, reasons, some of the factors that could lead to decision to make software or hardware open for public uh, public use and public inspection and uh, twerking. So we're talking about thing, um, factors like comfort, how comfortable the developer is as to be willing to make the his development open source and not be interested in the IP or the patent or money that could be made from the program. Then others could be the moral, probably decision of the developer, which may be in terms of uh, creating impact to his, com his immediate community or the global community. So I think, uh, that's a little bit of what we spoke about. So in that, in the area of benefits, it was more about benefiting the researcher or the developer wanting to benefit, so wanting to impact his community in terms of making some of this software, just like what Carmel said about the researchers in various parts of the world not being able to assess applications because of the pricing policies. So the developers would be interested in impacting, making an impact to the his immediate or the global community in order to make some of the softwares or tools accessible to everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, for the written room, as Pas said, please do add it in the pad. We'll go back and uh, look at that. But with that, I'm going to actually pass it to Omar to introduce for a uh, last talk for the day. Hello. Uh, thank you, Marika, uh, for handling the discussion. Uh, before I introduce our next speaker, uh, I must say that uh, we had uh, an interest, interesting discussion uh, by Andre uh, on open hardware, and that uh, and uh, we had another one with uh, for open software, uh, which makes the relation, which raises the question: What is the connection between open hardware and open software communities? So now I will hand over to Batula Al Maruzuk. Uh, she will be given her lecture on openness to diversity in knowledge, but. Thank you so much, Omar. Thank you. And yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, apologies for the delay and thank you so much for the invitation. Very, very excited to present uh, with Michelle and Andrea. Uh, I'll be speaking about diversity of knowledge and how is that linked to open science. Um, so uh, before anything, I just want to introduce myself very, very briefly for people who probably I have never met. Uh, I am a previous mentee, actually, and a mentor in the Oblast Science. Uh, I lead the community for Open Science Community Saudi Arabia. And I'm also, uh, my official title is the Research Project Manager. And it's the reason that I missed Andrea and Michelle too, because I was doing some sort of meeting. Um, so this talk will be around diversity of knowledge and how is that linked to Open Science. And just disclaimer, I'm not by any means an expert or probably actually no less than most of you here. Uh, also, openness uh, to diversity and knowledge is a huge, huge topic and can be taken um, from different angles. And the angle that I'll be discussing or covering is I'll be actually going very, very briefly about what it means when we say diversity of knowledge beyond the traditional way. Uh, and also in what ways uh, diversity of knowledge relevant to open science and more specifically I'll be speaking and linking to open source and how does language diversity also factor in the importance of diversity of knowledge. So when we say knowledge diversity, it goes beyond that traditional way of learning, which is usually written knowledge embedded in academia. Um, knowledge diversity could be oral knowledge, like listening to the stories of our grandparents. Uh, knowledge diversity, actually, very, very simply, 
all about celebrating the fact that there are many, many different ways of understanding the world around us. Uh, obviously, there are different forms of knowledge that exist across different culture, disciplines, ways of knowing. Uh, and when we embrace knowledge diversity, we open ourselves to really new perspective, to new insights that we would usually have overlooked otherwise. So knowledge diversity help us to gain that deeper appreciation of the rich complexity of the world around us. So um, just want to say a few things about oral knowledge because it's, it's usually really overlooked. And oral knowledge is really a form of knowledge that is passed down through spoken word from one generation to the next. It's a, really a primary mean cultural preservation it includes things like stories, myths, legends, songs, and many, many different cultures have really this rich tradition of oral knowledge. And this tradition often reflects the unique history, values, belief within this culture. And in many indigenous uh, culture, oral knowledge is also used to preserve that cultural practice or belief, including traditional stories, ceremonies, languages. For example, in African culture, Oral knowledge is often used to transmit that knowledge about history, geography, and also social organization. So the takeaway is that knowledge can, comes in more diverse form than we usually think about in the traditional way. And language diversity is one of these really, really important aspects as well. Uh, so as I mentioned uh, previously, language diversity is an important aspect of knowledge diversity in open science. Uh, different culture and community use different language to communicate and express that knowledge. Uh, and this language often reflects that unique culture perspectives and ways of understanding the world. Um, language diversity also play a very, very important role in promoting that ethical and equitable research practice. So in some culture, certain type of knowledge may be considered private, not meant to be shared publicly. And, and respecting these cultural norms or finding ways to conduct research that ethical is also important aspects of promoting that inclusivity within open science. Um, so how, how, how is that linked to open science, as I mentioned, and all specifically to open source? Um, as we know, open science is a global, global phenomenon. Um, you can look at this map and you going to find there's policies around open science infrastructure around the globe. So embracing that knowledge diversity is really, really a key aspect of open science. Uh, open science recognize that different culture, disciplines, ways of knowing bring really unique perspective to the larger body of knowledge. Uh, so open science really seeks to promote that inclusive and accessible scientific communication, which means supporting that use of multiple language in scientific publication and data sharing and open source and also other forms of scientific communication. Uh, so the question that we should probably reflect on how can, when it comes to open, some of these open science principles like open source, how can open source be adapted to accommodate that different language and cultural context? In what way can open science initiative promote that language diversity in the scientific communication? And, and what challenges and opportunity really can arise when open science initiatives seek to incorporate knowledge from diverse culture context. Um, I, I want to reflect just uh, probably in open source, uh, because you've seen a talk by Mitchell, uh, Michelle uh, before me. And if you look at this map of open source software contribution, this is specifically contribution for a very, very popular package called Request uh, in Python that has over probably 128 million downloads per month. Uh, if, if you see uh, the darker the color is where the contribution is coming from. And you see there is really low contribution in, 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 some, in some countries. And, and you, you come to ask why is that? Is it some sort of accessibility issue? Is it some sort of language issue? And, and that goes back to what we say about internationalization when it comes to open source. So just to explain what internationalization means, um, internationalization means 
allowing that open source project to support and satisfy the need of multiple locals. Uh, it comes within the design process and it helps to bring in more diverse community, more diverse countries, more diverse culture to contribute to that open source. And internationalization facilitates something that uh, localization. Um, I'm not going to elaborate on localization, but localization, you can think about it similar to translation, but it's taking that translation one step further and adaptation to meet that language culture to specific target or local. And there's many tools that can help in that process to automate it. Some of them called translation management system. I'm not going to go further into them, but it's these like some sort of tools that help us in sort of automate and manage the localization. And so the takeaway message is that um, these sort of tools are really, really benefit to the open source community, uh, help to internationalize these open source tools. Um, and to sum it up, just yeah, open science initiative probably could look into incorporate that local knowledge perspective to the scientific research and innovation. Um, open Science Initiative also can encode that collaboration and knowledge sharing across different culture and discipline uh, and the benefit that can bring. And Open Science also Initiative can also work with these local organization and uh, institution to build that capacity to promote that knowledge exchange. Um, and yeah, um, just to wrap it up, uh, to promote really equity in Open Science, uh, we probably must value that diversity and knowledge across the culture and all its form. Um, yeah, and, and pretty much that's everything from me. Thank you. Uh, can I stop um, thank you so much, Batu. Uh, anyone can now write a question or have feel free to unmute yourself and ask one. Uh, we can all agree that uh, there is no better time to discuss this topic in openness to diversity in knowledge than now. Thank you so much. We should give uh, Batul a round of applause. Uh, well, some people might be write, written, I mean, writing now a question. I have one. I have one. Um, um, Thank you, Paz. Yeah, you, you, Batul, you mentioned a few challenges uh, for the uh, uh, recognition of uh, different knowledges. Is there any specific one that you think is more prevalent, that is more noticeable maybe these days, one that you, yeah, that strikes as, as, as more, as bigger, I guess, I don't know, uh, to, for, yeah, for different knowledges or languages to be recognized as as needed, um, that would be, yeah. Uh, so, so most of the open science knowledge actually and sources is built in English and even tools as well to support Latin script, so languages that use Latin script. But when it comes to things that are languages that use non-Latin script, so it's not um, this like, uh, Urdu, Arabic, Farsi, so these sort of language that does not use really Latin script is it's not very well supported when it comes to using open source tools, it comes to use a lot of these technology or infrastructure within open science itself. Um, yeah, and that goes back to yeah, making it more really less accessible to these community also to use it. So that's one example that comes to my mind. And, and I didn't know if that answered your question. Faz. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, but all, I, I have a quick one too. Uh, in that map you shown, uh, uh, there is uh, a high distinction between uh, countries uh, in contributions towards uh, open source of uh, software. Uh, that software you made mention. Um, and you made mention of uh, some uh, some of the factors that may lead to this, maybe language barrier, maybe access to resources. Uh, so, do you think that all these uh, all these factors need to be addressed one by one to reduce the gap of this contribution? Yeah, that, that's a very very good question. Like, yeah. 
as you mentioned, one of these sort of barriers could be language, could be other sort of barriers. And understanding this barrier could not be communicated if we don't really reach out to these community themselves and understand like their need and what sort of barriers that they have. And yeah, about tackling or prioritizing or speaking about these sort of barriers uh, in, in different ways, it's really, really valuable because when we speak about open science, we mostly really focus in some aspect that is more relevant to global north sort of communities and uh, with little probably less, I would say, um, very conscious of that, probably attention to these sort of barriers. And again, it comes because that sort of communication is also a bit hard sometimes. Or it's, not, it's not as easy as you might think of. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if that answered your question, Omar. Thank you so much. Does anyone has another Thank question? You. So thank you, Batul, for sparing the time to have this presentation. Uh, yeah, and thank I you, everyone. Mark, yeah? Sorry, just I have one, I have one for anyone if, if they want to type in the chat or like, uh, because we have some, if I'm not mistaken, some people from Latin America and other regions. Mm -hmm. um, do you, it's very practical, very specific question. Like, have you seen uh, repositories or... Um, any sort of materials regarding open source software or open source hardware in your own languages and which ones are those, uh, if you can remember them. Um, yeah, that, that's my question for the, for the audience regarding a tool's presentation. I'm also thinking which ones I'm, I'm going to type if I remember. So uh, there is a question before people uh, finish thinking. There is a question from Patricia. Uh, she said, can you recommend some resource to know more about the translation management system? Yeah, so I was just trying to write actual the answer. So we, we actually write a chapter within the following play about translation management system and localization. We also have a call every two weeks within the Turing Quay. Let me just give you the Turing Quay repository. Uh, and I'm happy then, yeah, uh, let me just find it. Uh, wish we actually speak about translation management system, about localization, about supporting different languages, and how other people can use similar workflow as well. Um, I can give you the Turing Quay project is the one that we're trying to localize. Um, we'll take two minutes. And I will give you also the repository for the Turing Y, um, if you're not familiar with it. Um, so the, the chapter is not yet added, still will be R, but hopefully it'll be added this way. So this is the book, and you can access the GitHub repository, just my internet connection is very, very slow. But it says, uh, yeah, find it now, I can show you the repository. So. But we're trying to provide actually more resources, more discussion. We will also work in with the carbon trees. Uh, which is another community who also promote and advocate for language diversity. Um, so you're very, very welcome to join these calls. It's open for everyone. Uh, it's every two, uh, yeah, the second Tuesday of each month than the last one. Uh, I can email you more of uh, like the HackMD and the Zoom links, but they're all within the Turing Way Slack as well. If you're not part of it, you can join it. And the link is in the GitHub repository that I just posted. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, so it's nice uh, that everyone has uh, joined and we learned regarding open software, open hardware, and openness, diversity, uh, to diversity in knowledge. Uh, next week, there will be no cohort call. And it's advised that uh, our mentees meet with their mentors. Uh, we all see you in week 12. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We still have a few minutes, so uh, I know Batul has to leave, if I'm not mistaken. If you do, please, please feel free to go. We have some minutes, so we can stay here and uh, so people can ask things about the calls or the, the, the program. Let's use the time we have. If, if my clock is not bad, because, you know, 
it shows me that we still have 10 minutes. So um, it will, anyone that wants to stay here and, you know, comment or chat, welcome yes, to the pause. show. And, and thank you yeah, again to Miguel. Um, and Andre had to leave, but uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for being here today and giving us more uh, food for thought. Um, okay, thank you, Batu. <laughs> Have a good day. Um, any 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 questions? Ah, you you uh, go ahead, Chuka. All right, thank you for the opportunity. Um, fortunately, it's like Batu has left already uh, because uh, based on the maps that she she. Um, Broadcasted, uh, there was a quite a very big gap between the global north and the global south, and uh, part of what uh, has uh, part of the actually, I mean, part of um, the reason for that has been, I think, uh, the issue of access to information, uh, issue of access to information. So now the question I'm trying to raise on that is how can the science community, if possible, open science community contribute to making, uh, improving access to resources so that actually other parts of the world who actually have something to contribute could thrive. Then that's my first contribution. Then the second contribution was, is like a, a kind of open question. Like, is it not possible that some part of the world also, um, developers, researchers, and all may, may have issue with marrying um, the, the possibility of arrival from their work with eagerness to uh, contribute to open source, open source. What I mean by that is people coming from disadvantaged communities See, may see their ingenuity or their, their novelty, their production, their development, maybe in terms of application also as a way of arriving. By the time this gets out there and starts selling, I will make it. So that is not possible that that could also hamper the decision to contribute to open source, whether softwares or hardwares. It's an open question. Does someone, uh, maybe Mitchell or someone else want to comment on that or? No? Uh, uh, yeah, Mitchell, <laughs> go. Yeah, I can only say generally, you know, there are many different efforts to, to try and increase, uh, you know, open science in a whole range of communities. And there's both top-down things done by governments, but there's also a lot of grassroots uh, things done and, and then across um, different uh, communities. So if you're passionate about it, you know, for all of you, I just encourage you to find small ways to start in, in your local community, you know, either to leverage off something that's happening top-down and, and, you know, say to your local environment, hey, this kind of policy, you know, exists at, a, at, a, at an international level, shouldn't we be doing it locally or, or to leverage off something's happening locally, uh, you know, whether it's um, people involved in, say, Google developer groups, you know, internationally as a way into, you know, open source software or, um, you know, work by the carpentries or, yeah, just where you can start some of those conversations and get some small change happening you know every, every journey starts with you know one step and uh, if people just taking small keep taking small steps uh, then together we'll all end up somewhere really interesting yeah i agree yeah totally and i know like in my experience meeting in person with people with or in person or online but um with people with similar interests like if you already have two people in a room or just talking about it and see, thinking, okay, how can we make a difference or in, like, join this effort, this international effort? That is already a great start. And then <clears throat> you start meeting others and you start getting involved in projects and it's like a snowball. So um, it's like find people with similar interests near you and start seeing how to join, how to maybe get some funding, small ones or with a specific project. and. Um, I mean, you have project open science projects already. <clears throat> uh, you're working on them, so uh, that's a good excuse to 
to meet others collaborating near you. So, you know, you can stay in touch for a longer period. And then, you know, uh, just work together maybe e more easily if, if you were maybe having, I don't know, um, collaborators uh, very, very far away, which also works. But what I mean is like uh, meet, meeting people near you, like, and, and collaborating with them is, is, is great. So we can also like come come to the co-workings on Fridays and the cafeterias and you can find other people that you didn't know in this group, in this cohort that, uh, you know, might become friends and collaborators. So don't, don't, don't miss that opportunity if you can, the cafeterias and the co-workings on, on Fridays. Also to, just to brainstorm ideas of how to, who to join, what communities to join and, or how to create ones and stuff like that. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, uh, if someone else has any other comment, question, that can also be about the program, about, uh, if not, then we'll uh, uh, stop the recording. And thank you, Mitchell, again. Um, all the um, presentations are gonna be listed in the pad, so you can, uh, you can visit them and review them and get in touch with Michelle and the rest and Andrea and Batul if you need it. Um, so thank you so much. Michelle, we're going to invite you to the Slack. I don't know if you are already part of our Slack. You don't have to join if you're part of too many Slacks <laughs> or if you find it, I don't know. But you can also if you if you want and we'll be inviting you to the cafeterias and if all the co-workings as well. If, if you ever want to join us, it will be great. Um, and yeah, thank you again, everyone. Um, sorry for the messy breakout rooms earlier. It's early for me here in Argentina. Uh, anyways, big hugs to everyone. Thank you, Omar, for hosting today. Amazing to, to have you as always. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.